Okay. This talk is going to be about Taylor series and power series. Specifically, it's going to be about uh, two structures and uh, maps back and forth between them and the relation between those maps. Okay. So one structure is so, so some of the technical terminology you don't need to understand it if like if you know it that's good if you don't know it that's fine uh, you should just concentrate on the idea which is which is quite simple so on the one hand we have infinitely differentiable functions about x naught and i'll use the term germs if you don't want to know what a germ is and you don't already know you can sort of ignore this part but what does germ mean hmm can't remember which means you've seen it before. Yeah. So germ is basically just capturing the local behavior of, of a function. So basically two functions have the same germ about x naught if uh, they agree on some open interval containing x naught. Remember now? No, not really. Okay. So, uh, so, okay. so, so germs of C infinity functions about x naught basically just means, it just means infinitely different functions about x naught, but you consider two such functions to be the same or rather to have the same germ if they agree on some open set containing x0. So they agree immediately in your x0. Okay. So even if your two functions are, uh, are different far away from x0, you consider them to have the same germ if they are agreed on some open interval containing x0. Okay. Okay. Like the equivalence relations. Yeah. In fact, having the same germ is an equivalence relation. And, and the video we have on germs actually uh, proves exactly that, that having the same germ is an equivalence relation. We also prove in that, or oh, I don't know if we prove in that video or not, but uh, it's also true that, that the germ of the sum is a, a sort of well, just depends on the germ. So if I have, I can basically add germs of functions. When I add functions, then if I replace the function by others which have the same germ, the addition remains the same. So basically you can do addition for germs of C infinity function. You can do scalar multiplication. You can do multiplication. And so the germs of C infinity functions about any point have a structure where you can add, subtract, and multiply. Okay. And you can scale or multiply. And that kind of structure is called an R algebra. Again, if you don't know what that is, it's fine. Basically, you can, just like you can add, subtract, and multiply functions, right? Mm -hmm. And you get new functions by basically f plus g is the function it sends x to fx plus g. The same way you can do that for germs of functions. Okay. And now this structure, it's an, it's an algebra over the real, since this is you can add, scale, and multiply, therefore also subtract and, and multiply things. Uh, but it also has a differentiation, which means if I give you a germ of a C infinity function about x naught, you can tell me what the, what its derivative is. Okay. And two functions which have the same germ, their derivatives will also have the same germ as each other. So you can differentiate. Seen. So what does C infinitely mean? I'll just write this down. It means infinitely differentiable. Okay, so there's a lot of structure here. There's a an additive and scalar multiplication structure. That's a vector space structure. There is a multiplicative structure. And there is a differential structure. Okay? Hmm? Mm. Okay, good. So even if you don't understand the terminology, you just have to have these functions locally and you can add, subtract, scalar, multiply, multiply and uh, differentiate. Okay. On the other side, you have power series centered at x naught. So these are power series. Okay. They are basically uh, just uh, power series centered at x naught basically means they are things of the form summation a k x minus x naught to the k, where a k could be anything. So these are the coefficients. x naught is a, is a number which is known to us here, right? So it's the center box which you're doing everything. And these are the coefficients. a k are all real numbers. Okay. Now for power series, again, we have all the structures. We can add two power series. How do you add two power series centered at the same point? You just add them coefficient wise. Mm -hmm. Okay. How do you Scalar multiply, where you just scalar multiply on each of the coefficients. How do you multiply two power series? Well, it's a lot like how you multiply polynomials, right? Yeah. The same type of procedure. We've seen a bit of that in other videos. And so you can add, scalar, multiply, and multiply. You can do something else. 
you can differentiate a power series centered at a point. How do you differentiate? Again, formally. So each power, you know how to differentiate. Yeah. And then you just take sort of the formal sum. Okay. So both of these have have a number of a, a lot of structure to them, right? What's the structure? I mean, what's the structure you have on both sides? Hmm? What are the things you can do? Linear. Linear, that's addition, subtraction, and uh, addition, subtraction, scalar multiplication. Actually, subtraction just follows from addition and scalar multiplication. You also have multiplicative structure. You can multiply functions. You can multiply power series. And you have a differential structure. There's an additional structure we have, which I don't want to talk about, the sort of. I, there's no clear terminology for that, but there's a composition structure. It's sort of it's. I would have to introduce a lot of machinery to explain sort of the generic concept behind that. But the idea here in this case is simple. You can compose C infinity functions, but you have to be careful when you compose. The center could change, right? So, like you when you do f compose g, that makes sense only if f f f is defined at g x naught rather than f being defined at x naught. So there's a composition operation going on, but the composition operation sort of your center moves when you compose. So I'm not putting it in the structure, but that's also there. Similarly, there's a composition operation on power series that, that has a similar type of flavor. Okay, good. Now we have these two structures. We have operators going from here to here and here to here. Well, not quite, but almost. So germs of C infinity functions about x naught. Given any such thing, you can take its scalar series at x naught and you'll get a power series centered at x naught. Okay. How do we get that Taylor series? So suppose I have a function f. How do I get the Taylor series of f at x naught? K from zero to infinity. Hmm? I've k times differential derivative over k factorial times x minus x naught to k. Yeah, so the coefficients are these. So you're using your original uh, function to, to get the coefficients of the power series. Yeah. Okay, and, and therefore you get a power series here. Now, if I start with a power series, how can I try to use that to get a function defined about x naught? So, so I've explained what this operator does. Now I want to explain what the operator the other way does. Well, I can just try to actually try to, if I have this power series, summation k equals zero to infinity a k x minus x naught to the k, I just sort of try to define my function like this. Okay. Okay. Near x naught. Oh, by the way, I didn't say this, but the Taylor series operator actually is well defined up to germs because all the values of the derivatives just depend on the behavior very close to the point. So actually two functions having the same germ have, have the same Taylor series at the point. Now the power series summation, which is just basically you take your power series and you literally just add it up and see what it converges to. That operator is not well defined on all power series. It's well defined only on those power series which have a positive radius of convergence or maybe infinite but at least like a non-zero radius of convergence okay because if i take a power series like uh, suppose i took let's say what's the radius of convergence of this power series well how do the how are the coefficients growing uh, exponentially, super exponentially, super exponentially because the co because the exponent is k square, right? So therefore, the radius of convergence is what? R. R. The coefficients oh, are growing. One. The coefficients are growing super exponentially. So in general, what's what's the radius of convergence? It's the uh, one over lim soup of the basically this thing, which is basically just the rate of growth of the coefficients, right? Mm -hmm. If the coefficients are growing super exponentially, then the denominator becomes zero, well, infinity. And so the radius of convergence is zero, zero, right? Okay, so this power series has radius of convergence zero. This is centered at x equals zero, centered at x naught equals zero, and it has radius of convergence equal to zero. Similarly, suppose I gave you a
what would be the radius of convergence of this power series? Zero. Zero. Okay, and it now it's centered at three, so this is centered at x not equal three, but the radius of convergence is still zero for the same reason. The coefficients are growing super exponentially. Okay. Uh, now, if you have this type of power series, then you can definitely try to define a function which is the sum, but that function will be defined only at that point, right? If the function is defined only at that point, you don't get a germ of a C infinity function about the point. This is a function defined only at one point. On the other hand, if the if the power series had positive radius of convergence, for instance, suppose I gave you what's the radius of convergence of this power series? One. Why one? Because it is a rational function and the denominator degree difference of the denominator and numerator is greater than two. Greater than two than well, the degree difference would be relevant only when you're trying to say whether the endpoints are included. The radius of convergence is 1, just because, as you said in the beginning, it's a rational function. The coefficients are rational functions, so they're sub-exponential. Mm -hmm. Yeah? And what you said after that about the degrees thing, that would be relevant to figuring out whether the endpoints are included. Right? Okay. Yeah? Mm -hmm. That's what you, I did think that's what you're trying to say. Yeah, okay. Uh, so the interval of convergence is here is a minus one one closed closed because of what you said degree difference is greater than one but and the radius of convergence is one but we don't really care about the exact value the point is since there's a positive radius of convergence if i give you this power series centered at zero of course it's centered at zero then since it has a positive radius of convergence i can define this function i can define the function fx equals summation k equals 1 to infinity x to the k over k square plus 1 on an interval surrounding 0 and because I can do that then I take its germ and I get a germ of a c infinity function. Okay, so we have the operators both ways. Okay, now how good are these operators? Hmm? I don't know, looks good. By good, I mean, do they preserve the structure we have? So, there, as I said, there's structure here, right? There's addition, scalar multiplication, multiplication, and differentiation. When I do this operator, on the target side also, we have all these things. Does the operator preserve all those structures? Well, let's look at the Taylor series operator. Is it linear? Does it preserve addition and scalar multiplication? Yeah. Yes. Yes. We have a separate video proving that, but it basically follows on the fact that each of the derivatives individually is linear, right? Taylor series is just obtained by sort of summing up these things. Each of these individually is linear, and therefore you get that. Does it preserve the multiplication when I multiply two functions? So if I take the Taylor series of product, is that the same as a product of the Taylor series if I multiply them as power series? Yes. Yes. And what kind of rule for differentiation does that follow from? What rule for differentiation do we use in the proof of that? To show uh, that the Taylor series of the product is the product of the Taylor series? Chain rule. No. Product rule. Product rule, right? We are dealing with products. Okay. And the Taylor series also commutes with differentiation, which means the Taylor series of the derivative is the formal derivative of the Taylor series as a power series. And that, that again just follows just by taking the series, differentiating the terms and checking. It's a straightforward thing. We have separate videos on those. So the Taylor series operator is linear, preserves addition, scalar multiplication. It's multiplicative, follows from the product rule. Basically, it's, it's a proof by induction. It's a little complicated, but it's, it's straightforward if you actually sit down and start writing it out. Okay. It's not, it's not like immediately obvious, sort of straightforward, but it's straightforward once you actually do it. Okay. Uh, and it commutes to differentiation. And that's pretty straightforward. Okay. In fact, that's, that's where these k factorials come in. Remember when you differentiate this, you get a k from here and the power goes down by one and the k and the k factorial cancel and you get k minus one factorial. The k factorial is crucial to showing that differentiation works well. And finally, composition. Composition is tricky because as we said, that that you to compose functions you have to make sure that the sort of if you are composing f and g then f has to be centered at g x naught not at x naught so you have to be careful but 
if you're careful about that, you can show that Taylor series of a composite is a compositable Taylor series. You have to define the composition operation carefully on both structures. Okay. Now, how good is a power series summation operator? Pretty good. It's linear. What does that mean? Well, if I take two power series, I add them up formally, then and then I take what that converges to, that's the same as what the sum of this power series converges to plus what the sum of the other power series converges to. Mm -hmm. Okay, so adding them up, adding them up as power series and then seeing what it converges to is the same as seeing what each converges to and adding up. It's multiplicated, which is the same, multiplying them formally and then seeing what it converges to is the same as seeing what each converges to and multiplying those functions. Commutes the differentiation, which is the same formally differentiating and then summing up is the same as summing up and then form and then differentiating the function. And composition, that's a little uh, tricky to explain, but basically again, you compose them as power series, it's the same as, uh, and then you take the sum, it's the same as summing up and composing as functions, but again, you have to be careful because when you compose things, the center could change. Okay. So the next question is, are the composites the identity? So what do I mean by that? Well, you could start with the power series, sum it up and take the Taylor series. Now, uh, you could also do it the other way around. You could start with the function, take the Taylor series and then sum up. Okay. So there are a number of questions here about whether you can do these composites and uh, whether you always get back the same thing you started with. So why do we expect the composites to be the identity? Because the Taylor series is sort of, we are thinking of it as the best approximation of the function by polynomials, that's the Taylor polynomials, and the Taylor series is just the limit. So you are approximating it pretty closely, which means you hope that the Taylor series comes back to the original function. So, so you understood the, the two questions we have here? Mm, yeah. Okay, what do you think? Which composite should be the identity? Should both of them be the identity? Like each one is the identity on its side? Uh, maybe not. Okay, well the first one actually, so let's see. You start with the power series, the first one. Start with the power series, sum it up and take the Taylor series. That is the identity. If the power series you start with originally does have a positive radius of convergence, then you will get it back. I mean, if you don't start with something, If you don't start with something with positive radius of convergence, it doesn't even make sense to sum it up, right? Because you, you, you cannot sum it up to get a job, right? That's what our examples here were, right? Mm -hmm. You have this type of power series or this type of power series. These two power series don't actually uh, give you functions because their radius of convergence is zero, okay? So you cannot even do this, but if you could, then you got a function, you come back, you get the Taylor series is the same as the original power series. Uh, and the proof is you can actually prove it like one derivative at a time. You can uh, prove that the sum you get, each of its derivatives just works out fine. So you, you define your function like this and then you can check that f k x not over k factorial has to be a k. And you just ch check it by actually calculating this, formally differentiating, etc. And calculating this. So it's, it's, it's sort of the, the proof is the same as the proof that the Taylor series of a polynomial is the same polynomial. Remember that? Mm -hmm. It's sort of the same proof except now you're dealing with an infinite power series. Okay, so starting here, going like this and coming back, you do get the identity map almost, if you start in the part of this for which this is well defined. Okay, now what about the other way around? You start with a function that's C infinity or rather a germ of a C infinity function. You take its Taylor series and then you sum that back up. Here the answer surprisingly is no.
That is, you can have functions where the Taylor series doesn't sum up to the original function, even though it does sum up somewhere. So you can have no where it converges to something else. So you get something else instead. Okay, and uh, for those functions for which the answer is yes, those are actually called analytic functions or in, in our context, since you're doing everything locally, they're called locally analytic functions about x. You take its Taylor series at a point and then you sum it up. The power series sums up to the function around the point. It's called locally analytic. Well, we're doing it with germs, but you could also think of the functions for which we get them back around the point are called locally analytic. And you could also use the same term for uh, germs of functions. Okay. Okay, and functions or, or jobs. Okay, so we'll see an example for why this is no in, in a separate video. What I just want to highlight here is that one direction you do have an almost a yes in the sense if you start with something which uh, you can't, that, it does make sense to sum it up, then sum it up, take the Taylor series, you get back where you are. On the other, in the other direction or at starting from the other side, it doesn't always get back where you are. Those functions for which it does, are, are the locally analytic ones and for a locally analytic function therefore its power series is precisely the same as its Taylor series okay that is, if a function does have a power series expansion then that power series has to be its Taylor series okay if a function does have a power series that converges to it that power series is equal to the Taylor series on the other hand you could have C infinity functions uh, which don't have power series converging to them now also I, I want to say one more quick thing which is that we have not here dealt with issues of the radius of convergence like how big it is. So you could have situations where you have a C infinity function that's defined everywhere. You take its Taylor series at a point and then you sum it up. The power series sums up to the function around the point but it doesn't converge to the function everywhere. So the sort of uh, that's basically the fact that you can have locally analytic functions at points or functions that are locally analytic everywhere but not locally analytic. We are not however dealing with that issue here because we are just looking at germs. Okay.